consider this a professional courtesy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Real Estate Realities with the Rebel Broker. My name's Robert Whitelaw, and I am the Rebel Broker, licensed real estate broker in the state of California, member of the National Association of Real Tours. But please, don't hold that against me. I hope you all had a fantastic weekend. Feels good to be back in the saddle. Last week was nuts. Lots of escrows closing last week. The, the market's really, it's the usual thing, right? It's May. Uh, it's, it's, it's another May in the crazy real estate market. Um, and a really interesting real world, real life experience, I think is going to be worth sharing with you today. So make sure not to miss it. Don't tune out early. Because this could be the difference between you winning that escrow or winning that sale, winning that house, or not, uh, even if you're not the top dollar offer. So there you go. That's a nice little tease, right? That's what the professionals in the biz call a tease. Uh, as usual, the best ways to get in contact with me are through the website. Head on over to therebelbroker.com. From there, you can select... Uh, Contact Robert in the menu bar. Send uh, send along any ideas, suggestions, observations, questions, whatever might be burning deep, deep in your heart. I'll be happy to offer my two cents uh, to try to help you out in terms of navigating those real estate questions. And of course, if you would like to join the Rebel Underground, you can again visit therebelbroker.com. You can click on uh, any of the number of buttons. There's a number of them there. There's one associated with each player. There's one dead center of the re- website just below the big player to play all of the shows uh, to join the Rebel Underground. So feel free to take advantage of those links uh, we'll, and we'll we'll get you more info uh, from the inside, even more inside than you get already with the podcast. Okay, so let's start off with a couple of tidbits first. You know, originally when I jumped, because I've got a great show for you on Wednesday. Uh, this was, I was going to do this today because what we have is one of my favorite lists. So there's a, here's, a, here's another tease, right? Teasing for a future show. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, home unions research. Now, I like home union. They, we've talked about their stuff a lot, and they just came out with their 20 zip codes with the highest real estate returns. I love this list because we tend to use this as, uh, if not, a direct one-to-one guide, at least something to hint at where we might want to look in terms of finding real estate opportunities for investment. So we'll be talking about that on Wednesday. So make sure to tune in for that show. It's one of my favorites. We do it every every time they do it. Uh, I love doing a show on it because oftentimes what we'll do is also look uh, a little bit more detail into some of the markets that are up at the top. Big surprise. I don't want to, no spoilers, right? No spoilers. But this is an actually very surprising list. Their top 20 is missing something that I think is a huge eye opener for a lot of folks who still seem to buy into a lot of the headlines that we see in real estate that are supposed to be guiding us towards smart decisions. Uh, so we'll cover that as well. But today, the front and center, As a little real world experience, I want to share with you some things I'm actually seeing. Uh, And of course, as I've said before, the market is going nuts. Uh, Escrow has closed on this. So my my superstition relating to that is uh, is taken care of. And this one included an interesting perspective. Right Now, I've talked before about times when I've represented the buyer where I've managed to get my offer accepted when my understanding at the time was we were not the highest dollar amount uh, on the on the board. And remember, me as a real estate broker, I don't have control over this. All I can really do is present offers to my clients uh, and let them decide. I can encourage them to go one direction or another based on what I see and and how much trouble I think is, is going to get caused by certain conditions or or other types of things. But this is an interesting scenario because uh, these are clients who really wanted this process over. And and I think it's important to calibrate ourselves to this kind of thing. Um, These are folks who wanted to just get sold as soon as possible, uh, didn't want to be in the house while the home gets sold. uh, And just wanted to move on. Just what they were, they're moving out of state. Like I said, there's another couple moving to Idaho. Uh, we've, this is yet another one to add to the list. Um, these folks moving to Northern Idaho though, as opposed to, uh, the Boise area, as we've discussed before, but in any event, that was their primary motivation. 
That is not a horribly unusual motivation. Not every seller is going to be 100%, whatever the highest dollar amount is, is what I'm going to take. Now, here's what's also important. If you've got the right person representing you in terms of a real estate agent or a real estate broker, they're going to be able to explain the benefits and the downsides of all the elements of an offer. And I pride myself on doing that. It it should be a natural part of the negotiation process, right? So let's, let's flash back a little bit. Listed, got a relationship with this particular seller months and months ahead of the time they wanted to list it. So I was able to put in my my usual marketing plan, which which in this case got short circuited a little bit because they changed their schedule at the last minute. However, ended up they were out of the house, ready to get it sold uh, on day I don't know it was a Thursday or, or or late Thursday early Friday. So in the time they were out, I had to and the home was not photographable while they were in it. So I had to go and photograph it and all these wonderful things. And I was de- debating in my head the wisdom of doing an open house that weekend. Normally, my my strategy is to put a home on the MLS on a Tuesday. And in that Tuesday to Saturday time frame, all kinds of things happen. My direct mail pieces go out. My emails to the most active agents in that area go out. My, my emails to all my buyers who've been searching for a home in that area go out. I put it up on Zillow. I put it up on Truly. I, I aggregate it to all the websites, all that wonderful stuff, right, to, prom- to get it in front of as many people as possible for an open house. This did not happen this time. Uh, the, the, my client was like, you know, I'd really love for you to go ahead and do an open house. It's not like it'll cost us anything. You can still do all that stuff in the next week. All right, fine. We'll, we'll do that. Um, I'm very much a hit the ground hard and move fast kind of broker. But then I explained that, but they, they really wanted to go that way. So fine. So I implemented as much marketing as I could on that Friday and Saturday held an open house and sold it. So had a verbal commitment that offers were going to come in on Saturday from several different folks who visited. Um, I tell my client, you know, we, sh- we can wait till a certain date uh, in terms of entertaining offers. And he says, no, let's just take them as they come. I don't want to play that game. I'm not interested in, in getting everyone all hyped up and getting into this bidding frenzy. I just want to take them as they come. So we take them as they come. We get an offer in hand on, on uh, Monday. Uh, with a grand total of about four people saying they want to submit offers. First one comes in. Uh, my client likes it. The terms are excellent, right? And this is one of those situations where this particular offer benefited from the fact that I met the folks, that I met the buyers. And and also, I want to point out that in this particular scenario, what the buyer's agent should have done. Now, here's, here's the scenario. The buyers are a young family. They already have a child. The wife is pregnant and due in a couple of months. This is a ridiculously awesome family-oriented neighborhood. It's a cul-de-sac. It's the kind of street where kids play in the street and the yell car when a car is coming down uh, and get off the street. It, it's awesome. It's as close to Mayberry as you can get. And my sellers are very much drawn to bringing someone into the neighborhood that's going to make that element of the neighborhood stronger. They they love their neighbors. Uh, This is one of those places where you know everybody. I I met just about everyone who lived on that cul-de-sac. I met more people on that cul-de-sac that were neighbors of my client than I've met neighbors that I have in my community, which maybe says terrible things about me. But in my in the place where I live, you know, there's there's a few folks I know who tend to be more social. But that's really it. You know, I know the folks to the left of me, to the right of me, across the street from me. That That's kind of it. Here, these folks all know each other. And they very, and again, they very much wanted to, to play into that. So the type of folks that were buying played a big part in my seller's decision. And I, and I want to cover that part of this first because my, my sellers never met the buyers, Right. By the time we started showing this house, my sellers were a thousand miles away in Idaho. So never got a chance to meet them. All they knew about them was what I told them in terms of what I learned when I met them and I showed them around the home during the open house and all that kind of wonderful stuff. Um, And I met their agent at the same time. 
and they loved what they heard. And so I strongly encouraged the buyer's agent in this case to really make a powerful cover letter and make sure, and I, I want to, and if you really want to push it, I want to make sure you put a picture in there of, of the family together that's very recent. Take a, fo- take a photo right now outside of this house with them in it, right? Didn't take my advice. Uh, but I honestly told my sellers the kind of folks they were. I let them know that she was pregnant. Let them know that this is them trying to, trying to find that home they're going to stay in and raise their children and all that kind of wonderful stuff. Um, and I also strongly suggested that because their offer was not likely to be the strongest in terms of amount, they needed to make it super strong in other ways, right? Rattled off a couple of suggestions. Now, you might argue that this is me almost representing the other side. And, and to, to, to one degree or another, maybe that's true. But it was me giving information that I knew my sellers uh, were okay with sharing in terms of simply creating a deal that everyone would love. Now, here's the problem if you're a buyer. The broker on the other side, 99 times out of 100, is not going to do what I did for that buyer. Uh, they are going to absolutely push for whatever the highest amount offer is, uh, unless it's a deal where the offer that has more cash has all kinds of strings attached to it that could threaten the escrow closing, right? The, the more complicated the deal, the more difficult it is often to get it closed. So what they came in with was a under asking price offer on paper. However, because of the circumstances and the conditions they were willing to take on, it became very close to a full price offer because this buyer was willing to pay various fees, escrow costs that would normally in this area be be paid by the seller. So it didn't quite come to full asking price, but it came very close to asking price. In addition, they came in with zero contingencies. None. Now, we had committed to doing the uh, termite work, so we were going to do that. But they, no loan contingency, no appraisal contingency, which basically was them. They had to get a loan. They had to get an appraisal, but they were not making their offer contingent on it. Is that a risky move? Absolutely. But here's what it communicated to my sellers so strongly. These are folks who are dedicated to making this deal happen because if the deal doesn't happen, they're going to lose their earnest money deposit, which at at that point was 3% of the purchase price, which is also the maximum in California that you can lose if you default on a contract in that case, right? So here's a situation where the terms and conditions were tempting enough and the price tempting enough, given the overall real numbers, right? If we did a net sheet, right? If we did a net sheet between a full price offer with the normal things the seller was paying and a net sheet with this transaction, there was literally only a couple of thousand dollars difference between the two. So it was very much an an on par offer. Uh, But here's something else I told my seller. We have people in the wings who I think are likely to make offers over the next week for substantially more than this, for substantially more than asking price. And then that was decision time for this particular seller. They took a day to think about it, and he ended up accepting that offer. Now, I have no question in my mind that if we had gone with my normal plan of let's let another week go by, let's do another open house, then say all offers by Tuesday at 5 p.m., There's no question in my mind we would have gotten other offers that would have been substantially over asking price. I talked to one. They never submitted it because they didn't want to go into a backup position. They weren't interested in playing the waiting game. Uh, But they were like, well, you know, it was one of those odd conversations that realtors tend to have with one another where basically the buyer's agent is asking, what would it take for you to fall out of escrow, right? Uh, And they were suggesting an amount $20,000 over asking price. Um, So- that's where we were, and my folks were happy to accept the offer from uh, that particular buyer. And again, a scenario where they they were aware that that my advice was that this was a good offer in terms of terms, very close to asking price, but there was also 
a very strong, and I always phrase it that way when we don't have paper, right? And if I don't have a piece of paper, if I don't have an offer in my hand, nothing's real until it's written. So, uh, you know, it was, it was on the prospect of having another offer, but su- super strong, right? I had no, there was no question in my mind. I would have said, I will bet you a thousand dollars that in one week I can have you an offer that's for substantially more than this. And if I, if I fail to, if that ends up being wrong, I'll pay you the thousand bucks at close of escrow when we do, when we do close the deal. Um, and they ended up taking that deal. So it's a scenario where all the stuff came together and what swung it? What was the thing that was the key element here? Now, my folks, in terms of the price, um, you know, obviously, if you're in a situation where you're going to get a whole lot more money, that's very tempting. But the soft side of this deal is what really motivated my sellers. The soft side being soft to, to more firm, right? The soft part was the buyers themselves. They were sold on the people who were doing the buying. In my opinion, if... If it had been completely anonymous, right? And the reason why I'm kind of harping on this is because this is where automated real estate is taking things, right? If if things get to the point where it's automated, there there is none of this. You're not gonna you're you're gonna get very little of this personal one on one contact. In my opinion, if they had not known anything about the buyers, had didn't realize anything about them, uh, they would have been far more likely to hold out for an offer that I'm sure would have arrived within seven days of that offer. So something to think about. I, I think that that's, uh, you know, it, 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 in other words, I think the point I'm making in addition to what I just said a minute ago is even if you feel like you're being bid out on a lot of these, if, if you if you are uh, willing to go through the, the hassle of submitting offers over and over again, uh, and but you can bring something to the table and you feel like you can make an emotional appeal, that is on on occasion going to pay off for you. All right, we're going to talk a little bit more about this in a minute, uh, but we're going to take a quick break, so don't go away. We'll be right back. Are you ready to jump in and start your search for your first investment property? Maybe you've decided that it's time to own your own home, or maybe you're ready to sell your home and move on to something new. No matter what your goal is, the Rebel Broker can help. That's right. Aside from hosting this show, I am also the owner broker of White Lawn Sons Real Estate Services right here in Silicon Valley. With over 25 years experience serving Silicon Valley, Morgan Hill, San Martin, and Gilroy, I or one of my great agents can help you achieve your goals in real estate. So if you're ready to look into taking that next step towards achieving your real estate goals, point your browser at www.soldbyrobert.com. That's www.soldbyrobert.com robert.com and get in touch. Let me show you how I will earn your business and your respect. Again, that's www.soldbyrobert.com or you can call me at 408-852-0525, California Bureau of Real Estate ID 00984909. Welcome back everyone. Like I often like to do, I'm I'm sharing some real world experience here in terms of truth on the ground, things I'm actually seeing. Uh, and and so many times I hear people say, "Oh well, gosh, we can't even, we shouldn't even make an offer on that." And buyers uh, get frustrated, right? You you make X number of offers, and at some point you you give in to frustration. And I think the lesson to learn here is don't let that happen. Once you've decided to bur- purchase a home, particularly in a market like that we're experiencing right now, you need to realize this is a marathon; it's not a sprint. And a a very important part of that process is making offers. And I think whenever you find a property that fits your needs, you should make an offer on it, even if uh, you're you're coming in maybe a little under asking price. But make that offer as attractive as possible. We still have transactions falling through because of financing. Let's say you're like these buyers that I just dealt with. And you are 100% sure that your financing is going to go through. You've got a plan. You've got a backup plan. You are ready to rock and roll. You are not just uh, pre-qualified. You're pre-approved, right? We know the difference, right? Pre-qualified is a is a letter that just sort of says, given what I've been told, pre-approved means they've actually gone through the hoops. They've run your credit. They have gotten the, the entire application run through, and, and you're approved, Um and if you're confident on all of those aspects of the transaction, like these folks were, 
And boy, I tell you, as an agent, I would have been hard pressed. I would have had to have really serious conversation with my buyer as to whether or not that made sense. Uh, but in this case, it, it very much paid off that coupled with the personal connection they were able to make with my sellers, the type of buyer they were, uh, really made this deal work for them. Uh, you know, my clients didn't really want to sell to an investor. They didn't want to sell to a flipper. Uh, there were some flippers interested in this particular property. I had some folks come in and look at it. Um, now, of course, they tend to make offers at a more aggressive level, and that wasn't something my clients were willing to do. But the point is, there were other options. The, these were not sellers who were in a position where they should have felt like they should be panicking. At the point I told them we had an offer in hand, we were literally three days into the MLS. We got that offer, I think, late Sunday, early Monday. It had not gone onto the MLS until about 5 or 6 p.m. on Friday. There was less than 24 hours between the day it went on the MLS and the day that we had an open house. So this was the very beginning of, of what I calibrated to them to. And in fact, on average in that marketplace, 10 days was the average days on market. So for our days on market to be three, four days, shouldn't be panicking at all, but they like, they, they liked it, that it felt good. And that's where you need to go. Investing proper investment properties are different, right? That's all about numbers. That's about math. Does do the, does the number game work there? Uh, and particularly for folks who are selling properties like that, that's what the, the, it is too. It's a numbers thing. Uh, I can go in and say, listen, I'm not going to pay your price because at that it's negative cash flow. You've got four units and you know, I can do this and that to them, but then that'll be more money I have into it. And the, so the cap rate and the, and the, the cash flow just doesn't work. That's that's the length of the conversation. When you're dealing with a home you're going to buy for you to live in, or if you're dealing with a non-investment property, absolutely there's an emotional side to the transaction that if you can turn that part to you, folks will look for reasons to accept the other elements of your offer because they want to feel good when it's all over. Um and now, have I had clients who are selling their personal home where that the how they the personal feelings didn't enter into it at all? At all, absolutely, uh, they couldn't have cared less who bought it as long as the number was the high as high as possible. And is that going to be a dominant force in the market? Yeah, of course it is. But that's why you need to treat this as a numbers game. And when the market is this lopsided towards sellers, you as a buyer should start to get comfortable with the idea of submitting offers one after the other. And here's the deal. It has never been easier to submit offers, right? You can create with your agent the quote unquote template offer where all the stuff is filled out. Uh, of course, there will be specifics for that property, like the address, the parcel number, the date, the name of the seller, the address, all that other kind of wonderful stuff, the price, all those things will change. But all you have to do is just have a template that's already filled out with all the stuff that you're kind of thinking you want to do in terms of what makes your offer s sexy and submit. And if necessary, if you're out there really working it, check the checkbox that says this offer is potentially a situation where I'm making multiple offers. So in order for this to be a valid offer, and this is a great strategy, I think, for buyers to use. And here's, here's let me lay it out for you. Let's say you are that buyer and you are going to make offers on everything. So you may be making two offers a day, three offers, four offers a week, five offers a week, whatever you're doing, so that you're worried about overlap. The concern you have is, well, what if someone signs, what if I get two people who have offers from me in their hands at the same time and they sign it to accept it? Well, now I'm in contract on two different homes. Here's the deal. There's a checkbox you can check so that you're communicating to them. I may be making offers on multiple homes. So the only way this is valid is not only if you sign it, but then I acknowledge your signature. And it's a great way to put a little bit more power back in your hands. Uh, but this idea of going out and making as many offers as you can on all the properties that'll fit your needs, uh, I think is a good one. And I think it's something that if buyers can get into that mindset and be willing to do that and just accept the idea that you're going to get tons of turndowns, but by being aggressive, you're going to be doing it so frequently that you're going to end up buying that house sooner than a lot of other folks. But emphasize that you are also going to push the emotional side Tell your story to the seller in a way that makes them feel good, 
right? Now, I, I unashamedly do this with veterans. I love representing veterans. I, I Veterans are ridiculously underrepresented, at least by, by good agents. I, I find that agents that uh, tend to inherit or get their hands on veterans are, are less than great, uh, primarily because a lot of agents simply don't want to deal with VA stuff. And for all of you out there, agents alike, VA is way easier now than it was. If you've been in this business a long time and the memories you have of doing VA in the early 2000s or 1990s is why you don't like to do VA, stop. It's all 10 times easier now. Uh, it's ridiculously uh, mellow to do. And I find that I close more reliably VA deals than even others. Now, is there a weirdness? Yeah, there's absolutely going to be weirdness. But as long as you are proactive and you and you confront those complaints that the VA makes during the inspection process, they may complain about really goofy crap. They're one of the only organizations where when I push back, I don't get an automatic refusal. They'll actually talk to me about that stuff. But anyway, so that's a, that's a side note. Uh, so I like doing VA uh, as just because it's, it, I, I, I like trying to help veterans get the deal that, that they want. But the point here is that I was originally trying to make is that I am an unashamed promoter of VA buyers. Um, I, I love telling their story and nine times out of 10, that works dramatically to my advantage. You know, I talk about, uh, a, you know, a young man or a young woman who went off to serve and they were in the Navy or they were in the Air Force or they were in the Army or the Marine Corps and I get a photo of them in their dress whites or dress blues and, you know, then show up the, the progression of how they, they, you know, met their spouse and working now to create that family, have their first child or have that first child. I am a shameless <laughs> promoter of veterans when I am, because it that needs to be part of the deal, right? Um, because I'm having to overcome some negative perceptions, usually on the part of the real estate agent on the other side, um, and and convey to them that I that this deal can be amazingly easy and can feel good. So, and I've had that, then that has worked for me. I mean, the, the emotional appeal has worked way more often for me than I think people would guess in terms of being able to get the transaction that they want. So don't underestimate it. Don't underestimate the power of the personal connection, even when they never meet, right? Build that personal connection between the buyer and seller by telling the buyer's story. Now, here's the key. You as the buyer's agent need to be, take responsibility for telling that story. Don't let the seller's agent own that. O odds are the seller's agent is going to push whatever is the highest priced offer with the highest probability of closing, right? Which, which may be completely in line with what the sellers are doing. But if you're in one of those scenarios where the seller has a little bit more of a, an emotional investment in it, you're going to want to tell that story. And the best way to do that is through the uh, the cover letter. And I always include photos in my cover letters. If you're not including photos in your cover letters, you are not doing it right. Make sure that you're including that stuff because that's going to really create a connection between uh, the buyer and the seller. Okay. Next on our list uh, today is some very interesting news. And I think it really plays into things we've talked about here on the show before. Now, I call it price banding. Uh, I'm sure there's probably a more technical term for it, but it is activity at different price points, right? And we've talked about how here in Morgan Hill, there's typically a $1.1 million wall. Once you're priced over 1.1 million bucks, the days on market changes. You, you get much, far more days on market. Uh, you tend to get much closer to asking price, if not below asking price. Uh, so it's it's a different beast. Interesting news from CNBC New York City's luxury housing market saturated with inventory. Um, I think that is ridiculously interesting. Um, we're and I think that's something we're seeing across a lot of marketplaces where there is uh, there's a lot to be found at that higher price point. Now, why would I bring this up? Well, a couple of reasons. One, that does not spell seller's market. If you're, let's say you're a buyer and you are able to nudge up against whatever that luxury level is, I would argue that you should adopt the philosophy we just talked about, where you just start making offer after offer after offer that is lowball on luxury. I think we are at a primo time for folks in a lot of different markets 
to potentially, and sadly, I don't think that's going to be the case in my marketplace. There's going to have to be a lot of things in play for you to make this work. You're going to need the, the right seller is going to be someone who, you know, obviously has a luxury listing, uh, maybe has been on the market longer. Typically, sellers aren't going to start getting concerned about, you know, how long their home has been on the market till it's at least a few weeks over what the average is in that marketplace. But you also will find that the luxury agent at that price point can become an advocate for you, even with you lowballing it. They 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 are going to want to get that check. So if they're seeing a lot of problems relating to getting their that home sold, while they're getting advertising free advertising out of it, which is a thing to consider, they they want that check more than they really want that free advertising in a lot of cases. So go in there and feel aggressive. I think for all you folks out there that are potentially thinking about making a purchase that you would consider luxury in your market. Make sure you're getting good data. Now, of course, we're talking about New York. You may not be in New York, but I think this is something to consider in any market that you are in. So talk to your real estate agent. Find out where luxury starts in your marketplace. How are you going to know that? What you're going to want to do is run the numbers on days on market, two, two different sets of numbers, days on market against sales price. And you're gonna, you can graph that, and at this, at that point where you start to see uh, days on market jump, see what that price is, and then the next thing you're gonna want to figure out is percent of list price versus sales price. And as soon as you see that number hitting zero and negative percents, figure out that number. Somewhere between those two numbers, you've just figured out is your luxury market wall sweet spot. And if you're willing, if you're someone who's able to purchase above that point, do it, but look for, be willing to do very aggressive offers on properties that are way above. Now, let's pretend you do that math and that number ends up being between 1.2 and $1.5 million, or or let's make it even simpler. Let's just make it a million dollars. Well, let's say you find a home that's marketed at $1.8 million that's been on the market, that fits the criteria, it's been on longer, there's a good likelihood that the seller might be a little concerned about the fact they're still in the market. Maybe you make an offer on that property at 1.1 million, 1.2 million, instead of the 1.8. In other words, be more bold. At those price points, once you've figured out where that wall is, be bold on those properties and really be aggressive in your in your price uh, offers. All right, folks. Thanks again for listening. As always, the goal of the show is to leave you with more knowledge on the table than time you invested. Hope we achieved that today. Thanks again for listening, everyone. I'll talk to you all next time.